You've been searching for the best way to generate passive income in your life and heard that real estate is a great way to do it. But you're tired of all the so-called gurus who are all talk and no substance. Get ready to celebrate because Kevin Buck has spent 14 years successfully making it happen. This is the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast. Now, here's Kevin Buck. Hey guys, Kevin Bupp here, and I want to welcome you to another episode of the Real Estate Investing for Cash Flow podcast, where our mission is to help you build and maintain massive amounts of cash flow through income producing real estate investments. Now, our guest for this week's show was real estate expert Matt Seamus. Now, at the age of 20, Matt got his real estate license. He sold his childhood home for a tidy profit and has been hooked on real estate investing ever since. Uh, Matt began his real estate investing journey acquiring and renovating single family and small multifamily properties, forcing value through physical improvements and efficient property management. His strategy has been to purchase undervalued properties in desirable neighborhoods and improve them, thereby increasing cash flow and the value of the underlying real estate. Now, Matt brings the same simple but effective approach to larger commercial properties via Driven Capital Partners. Now, prior to his real estate endeavors, Matt spent six years at Facebook where he developed programs to introduce the internet to the poorest countries in the world via Facebook's internet.org initiative, developed Facebook's original Facebook for iOS app, and also launched a subscription business model for video content creators. Prior to Facebook, Matt founded two music technology companies after beginning his career as an investment banking analyst. And so with that, guys, I'm super excited to get on to the interview with Matt. But before we do, I just have a few quick housekeeping items. First and foremost, I want to provide some additional context here. I recorded this interview with Matt on April 28th, and so it was right in the middle of the pandemic. And first and foremost, guys, I just want to provide some additional context here. I actually did this interview with Matt on April 28th, and so it was right in the middle of the pandemic and the nationwide shutdown. So be sure to take this in consideration when listening into the show. Uh, moving on here. Uh, guys, we're in deal acquisition mode here at Sunrise Capital Investors. In fact, we always are. There's never a point in time where we will not take down a great opportunity that comes our way. And the reason that I make mention of this is because I'm looking for opportunities to pay you a huge finder's fee for bringing us deals. And you know what defines huge? Well, how about upwards of $200,000 for the right deal? Simply reach out to us via our website at sunrisecapitalinvestors.com and drop us a message if you got an opportunity for us to talk about. And also, this might be a perfect way for you to get into the business all while working with a group that has a stellar track record. And you know, one other note to mention here is that we're actually working on a dedicated website where you can both download our investment criteria as well as submit any deals that you'd like to discuss with us. And I'll be actually announcing that here on the next episode. So stay tuned. And last thing I'd like to mention here before getting onto the show with Matt is our free 30-minute phone call each and every Friday, where I open up two time slots where you can jump on the phone with me and talk about everything and anything your heart desires about real estate investing. Simply go to kevinbupp.com to get signed up. And just to clarify, this is not a sales pitch, but rather just a way of me being able to connect with you and hopefully add some value to you and your business. And so again, go to kevinbupp.com to get signed up for that free call. So now, guys, without further ado, I'd like to get on to the part of the show that you've been waiting for, which is our interview with Matt Seamus. So here we go. Alrighty, guys, it's my honor to introduce my guest for today's show, a real estate investment expert and co-founder of Driven Capital Partners, Matt Seamus. Matt, how's it going, bud? Kevin, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, th thanks for joining us here amidst these uh, very different times that we find ourselves in here over the last couple of months. And uh, uh, Matt, just to give our uh, listeners a sense of geography, uh, where are you coming from today? Where are you based out of? I am in Los Gatos, California, Bay Area. Um, and it's a beautiful day. So I figured let's, I'll take my, uh, meetings outside and try and enjoy the, uh, the beautiful weather. Yeah, no, fantastic. We were just talking about that before we got rolling here. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, uh, you know, both I, I'm incredibly blessed. I think you are as well, where you live with the good weather, especially during a period of, of life where we, you know, are basically on somewhat of a lockdown and, um, you know, it just, uh, the weather is a very nice little added treat or icing on the cake, you know, when we're going through, you know, very challenging times such as this. So I can see you in the background. For those that are watching the video, Matt's got some, uh, he's got some beautiful trees in the background, nice blue sky. And so things are looking pretty good on your end, my friend. <laughs> yeah, I'm happy. I'm happy. Yeah. Well, Matt, if we could, for those folks that are familiar with you, uh, don't know who you are, haven't heard any other podcasts, what have you, I don't know of your business, uh, maybe take a few minutes and just tell us a little bit more about yourself and your background and, and ultimately how you ended up in real estate. Yeah, so I 
got my, I was always interested in real estate um, as kind of an investing um, channel, even from kind of when I was, when I was a young kid, my uncle had some rental properties um, and I got my real estate license when I was like 19. And I ended up selling my mom's house, which was kind of this epiphany moment for me where I just realized, man, there's something here that I need to uh, understand a little bit better. She made a, a nice profit on it and it just was a light bulb moment for me. Um, I went to college. I actually was going to go into commercial brokerage, but I, um, I, got, I had an internship that just didn't click. I just didn't like it for whatever reason. It didn't feel great. Mm -hmm. And so I ended up going into investment banking um, and uh, learned, kind of developed my financial acumen there and really learned a tremendous amount about, uh, you know, just structuring deals, um, looking at opportunities, underwriting. Mm -hmm. uh, and I ended up starting two different tech companies uh, and ended up selling both of those. And selling, kind of on the tail end of selling the second, I, uh, I started talking with some people at Facebook, uh, some mutual friends at Facebook. And this was back in 2011. Uh, I joined Facebook in 2012 and worked there for six years um, and worked on the original Facebook for iPhone app, uh, amongst other things. Wow. But um, as soon as I started making a little bit of money in my professional career, I was spending as much time and energy as I could on the side um, investing in real estate very actively. And that's just kind of my nature. I like to go do things. Uh, I am very analytical, so I, I do spend probably more time in, in many cases than necessary uh, looking at an opportunity, but then I like to go get my hands dirty. Um, and so I have this thesis of uh, I'm going to go buy one house a year. I'm going to buy a uh, kind of the worst property in a decent neighborhood, mm -hmm. not a great neighborhood, but a decent neighborhood. And I'm going to force value by renovating the property and I'm going to look to find a long-term tenant, someone that wants to stay there three or more years. And I, I just thought, you know, with this combination, if I can create the nicest rental property available in the neighborhood, hands down, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be able to attract higher quality tenants. I'm going to be able to uh, keep tenants longer term because they're not going to want to move anywhere else. And I'm going to be able to charge rents that are higher than anyone else is telling me is a possibility because I'm essentially creating this new category of, of a, yeah. a really nice rental property. And so this was my kind of original hypothesis. And I, I did it the first time. It worked pretty well. Um, and I kind of realized, okay, I'm going to do this again, but I don't need to wait another year. I can go get after it right now. And what I, what I learned was uh, it, the, the program was working well. Uh, I was executing things pretty well, learning a ton along the way. I ran out of my own cash at some point and started taking on investors, uh, friends and uh, former uh, call, some, some guys that I went to college with, mm -hmm. uh, coworkers, things like that. And I just realized at some point that I do not want to own 100 or 200 single family homes. It's not, it's not the uh, scalable business that I think uh, my future uh, really wants. And so I started researching in probably 2013, 14, pretty heavily. I started looking into, all right, my next purchase is going to be multifamily. Mm -hmm. I'm going to buy a part, an apartment complex. Um, the, the, the challenge for me personally was simply actually gaining the confidence to actually go do it. Uh, so it took me a few years to, took me a few years of kicking around the idea before I actually went, went and did it. Uh, so fast forward now I run driven capital partners, uh, driven capital partners is just a real estate private equity group. It's just me and my partner, Dan Kennedy, who's in long beach and I'm in the Bay area. So we're both in California. And we go look for uh, opportunistic investments. Uh, we don't have a specific asset class or a specific market that we are uh, married to. We look for great opportunities and, uh, and we look to go deploy our own cash. That's why we started the business is to go put our own money to work. Um, 
many deals we syndicate, some deals we don't, some deals we buy on our own, some deals are, uh, you know, we can structure in a way that, that doesn't necessitate syndication. Mm -hmm. uh, we're really kind of real estate entrepreneurs and looking, you know, turning over as many rocks as we can and trying to see where, where there's opportunity and then going and taking advantage of it. Got it. Got it. Fantastic. I appreciate that background and, and, uh, and additional context there. And I, and I, I understand the, uh, I guess the, uh, uh, you know, the, the single family home side, the, the challenge you came, you know, you arrived at ultimately of a scalability challenge. Uh, cause I went down that road, but I went a lot further down that road than it sounds like you did and, and realized that, you know, managing 130 plus single family properties and, and how much time and energy it took me to acquire that many properties. I could have probably had a portfolio 10 times the size, uh, if I would have focused on multifamily assets. Right. And so that, that was many years back and, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's been long gone since then. And, uh, I've realized that, you know, commercial real estate is a much more scalable model. And, you know, it's interesting that as we talk about this, it's, you know, there are a few companies that have mastered it, right? I mean, I don't know, maybe not master is the right word, but they've ultimately figured the, the single family, uh, uh, growth strategy out or the scalability strategy, you know, some of the bigger PE firms such as Blackstone and uh, a few others as well that have followed that same model and have acquired, you know, hundreds of thousands of single family properties here throughout the U.S. and have seemingly done really well with that asset class. But, but then again, uh, they've got a, lo a lot of additional resources and access to capital that folks like you and I might not have, right? And so they've got a lot more uh, infrastructure in place and the ability to put that necessary infrastructure in place to make it an efficient model. And so um, I do think that for folks of, of, of our size, you know, smaller PE firms, it's a much more scalable and efficient model to go after the opportunistic commercial real estate asset classes such as we're talking about here today. And so what I love to, to maybe go on to next, if we could, Matt, is, you know, one of the things that I've, uh, that I've always, you know, taught over the years and that I've, I've tried to um, stay tried and true with is, is, is a core focus, uh, not necessarily uh, only one asset class at a time, but ultimately if, if I'm going to start buying multifamily properties, I'm going to focus on that asset class for at least a number of years until I've, I feel like I've mastered it right before uh, diversifying outside into another asset class, at least from an active perspective. That doesn't mean that I might not be a limited partner in, in you know, office deals, retail deals, what have you. But as far as in an active nature, staying focused on that one core asset class so that I don't you know, ultimately chase a lot of different shiny objects and, and get uh, uh, you know, my focus diverted. And so I love to hear from your perspective of ultimately, um, you know, how you guys arrived at that decision that you would just ultimately classify yourselves as opportunistic real estate investors and then how that's really played out as you guys have kind of dove in and started looking underneath the different rocks and, and uncovering deals, deals that are multifamily, deals that are office. Uh, I saw on your website, you had a sale lease back that you just did uh, uh, over the last couple of years. Um, there's a you know, new, new development, there's a redevelopment. You've just got a lot of different things going on and each one of them takes a very different type of skills, right? There's some crossover there. There's surely crossover, but each one takes its own unique skill set. And so anyway, I'd love for you to elaborate on that if you could and, and ultimately how you guys have uh, become so good at doing so many different things. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah. That's, um, this is a constant discussion. So there are trade-offs with, um, you know, on one end of the spectrum, you can specialize to an extreme degree mm -hmm. uh, in asset class and or market. On the other end of the spectrum, and if you do that, you have some, some tremendous benefits. Um, there are drawbacks too. What if that your market is all of a sudden, uh, ha uh, dynamics change in that market um, mm -hmm. to the point that it makes it uninvestable or dynamics change in that asset class to the point that it makes it uninvestable or your original hypothesis is no longer, uh, no longer holds. It doesn't make any, any sense anymore. You're, you're simply stuck to the tools that you know how to use. Um, now, the challenges with a diversified kind of opportunistic approach, which we employ, are that you have a lot more information to uh, try to kind of understand and, and assimilate. You have information on different markets and on different asset classes. And um, one of the benefits that we see is actually – I think you have a chance to see trends in a, in a different way when you are not focused heads down on a specific asset class or a specific market. And that's something that 
um, that we is kind of part of our investing thesis is we want to be able to spot trends um, as they're emerging and we want to quickly develop uh, a hypothesis and then determine do we want to go act on that or not um, so uh, that's in, that's one thing that that is is valuable it looks like you have something to add. yeah and I, and I don't want to interrupt you but I want to make sure I don't forget this thought so maybe give me an example in your business of you know elaborate on that like you saw a trend you saw an opportunity uh, and you guys took advantage of it so can you give me maybe an example of one of the deals you've done in the past of uh, uh, and how that's played out yeah. So we, uh, we love kind of emerging markets in the U S mm -hmm. and so we, tr we typically will stay away from the core, uh, the core markets and we'll stay away from the core, uh, downtown central business district locations. Mm -hmm. One of the markets that we love is Huntsville, Alabama. Mm -hmm. Um, Huntsville is the fastest growing city in the state of Alabama. It will within a couple of years be the largest city in the state. And it's very progressive for, uh, for Alabama, uh, kind of Alabama standards. Uh, and it's got just tremendous growth and tremendous opportunity in front of it. We originally were looking at multifamily in Huntsville. The challenge was everyone else sees the same data, the job growth, the uh, employment growth, the incomes rising, and the limited housing supply. And there is so much interest in multifamily not just in Huntsville, you know, generally throughout the U.S. Uh, there's so much interest in multifamily that pricing was being bid kind of out of control in, in our opinion. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we, we looked at was what are the other ways that we can make a bet on increasing populations, rising incomes, and uh, generally a growing area. And so one of the, the bets that we made was in medical office. So we purchased two medical office properties in Huntsville uh, last year to basically as an alternative way to make a bet on a growing location with rising incomes and rising employment. And the thesis is essentially, number one, everything that we've looked at in the last couple of years, we want, we've looked at through the lens of, we don't know when there will be a recession or a downturn, but we expect that there will be one. We didn't know coronavirus would be the culprit, but we did look at everything that we were buying through the lens of, do we want to own this during a downturn? And do we think it's going to perform well during a downturn? So mm -hmm. that was the first thing that we were, we were kind of thinking, kind of a defensive mindset. Um, but the, the, the next thing that we, we understood were the trends of aging populations throughout the U.S. And, uh, generally increasing costs of medical services. And then there's also this trend of uh, medical services being offered by third parties separate and away from kind of the core hospital setting. So we felt like if we can find a medical office property in a great location, we wanted an A location and that had some upside, um, then that would be something that we would be interested in in, uh, in acquiring. And so we found exactly that. Um, and so our tenants are dentists, uh, dermatologists, physical therapists, uh, things like that. And so we are, that's an example of uh, an opportunity that we jumped on because we were, we kind of, we were educated enough about uh, about the, the commercial space and we, we kind of were letting the medical office um, hypothesis brew for a while and mm -hmm. continue to kind of do our research. And what we ended up doing is buying this property, which was about 75% occupied, but we bought it at a seven, about a seven and a half cap in place. Wow. So tremendous upside opportunity. And you don't see that opportunity in multifamily. Very interesting. And so is that on a, uh, on a triple net lease as well? So with the individual uh, tenants that that property. So there's actually two properties uh, that mm -hmm. we structured as a, as a portfolio. One of them is triple net. The other, and it's, it's dentists. Uh, it's in like, an amazing location across the street from the only whole foods in town, like busiest place you could be any, mm -hmm. any weekday afternoon. Um, great. Just absolutely great location. That's a triple. Those are triple net leases. The other property is not. Uh, they're full service leases, but part of our business plan is to uh, transition the leases to triple net as they, um, as they turn over or as leases renew or as new tenants come in and, and take their, 
their place. Got it. Got it. Very, very interesting. And so as far as relationships with brokers are concerned, I'm assuming that probably came to you through a, a broker relationship or your broker network. And you know, being that you guys are on the opportunistic side of things, is it, is it just a matter of, of, of having a, a few different relationships with you know, a medical office broker, someone that specializes in that side, uh, an individual that specializes in, you know, maybe office or industrial, what have you, or, I mean, just give me a sense of, of how these deals, how, how do you create the deal flow? How did deal flow come about for this particular opportunity? This, this particular one is more, I think, a result of us being very, very embedded in the Huntsville market. Okay. Um, we, you know, one of the other interesting things is, from a, uh, from a sourcing or acquisition perspective, multifamily gets the vast majority of the attention. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are many small brokers, uh, small time brokers who do two, three, four deals a year and they do not have a large distribution list. Mm-hmm. And while they may offer their property, quote unquote, they're listing the property, they don't have great distribution. So if you happen to be one of the people that they distribute to, you may be one of 10 or 20 groups that's seeing the opportunity as opposed to one of a thousand groups that's Mm -hmm. seeing the opportunity. And that's, I think, the case more and more with some of these commercial asset classes. And um, so again, there's a tremendous learning curve because you need to understand how commercial leases work. You need to understand how to, I mean, it took us it took us probably six to nine months of looking at commercial deals before we were comfortable pulling the trigger on the mm-hmm. first one because we spent time looking at, you got to read through the leases. You have to understand what, uh, what they mean. You have to understand where, where the value creation opportunity is. You have to understand how to quantify uh, the value creation opportunity. Underwriting a commercial deal requires different modeling capabilities. So it took some time to develop mm-hmm. kind of that fundamental kind of infrastructure skill set. But now that we have now that we have it, the world feels a little bit more opened up. That doesn't mean we are experts in every asset class. We're certainly not. All we want to do at this point is be knowledgeable enough that we're dangerous and we can identify and spot opportunities and so that we are not single-minded focused on something and missing a great opportunity just because we don't understand how to look at it. Yeah, no, 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 great points there. And, um, you know, as far as this particular medical office, you mentioned that it was 25%, you know, vacant when you uh, acquired it. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know when you acquired it, but uh, have you been able to capitalize on that upside opportunity and filling that vacancy? So we actually purchased this, uh, the end of 2019. So we we've oh, only, okay. had, so, we only had it a few months. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously we're in a, a tough moment with coronavirus, right? It's very difficult yeah. to lease vacant space right at this moment. Um, so no, no, we haven't leased up the, there's two vacancies. We haven't leased up the two vacant spaces, but we are getting, um, we have enough demand that we, we have uh, visibility into, into when we think that'll be. We think it'll be within the next handful of months that we'll get those spaces leased. Got it. Got it. And then outside of Huntsville, what other markets are you in? Cause I know that you're, you're a huge proponent of diversification amongst not just asset classes, but also markets. And we've been speaking to Huntsville. What are some of the other markets that, that you and your team are you know, hot and heavy on? So we, we own multifamily in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a, as you mentioned, a sale leaseback property outside of Indianapolis. Um, we have a, uh, an, uh, a multifamily project. It's a little bit more, it's an office to multifamily conversion project in Santa Barbara, California. Um, we have a, uh, so those are some of the other markets. We are looking at uh, Boise. Idaho is a market that we really like and we have a deal in contract there. Um, and, and we expect that to be our first of many acquisitions there. One of the things that we, uh, we realized was uh, the, there is a burden, a tremendous burden with this business model of having projects scattered across the U.S. So and there what, is. Yeah, what's that burden? <laughs> well, it's travel, right? That's it. That's it. I understand. We, we've got stuff in 13 states, so I, I get it. It's, um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you, you know better even than I do. Um, it, it's travel and it's, you know, is there a direct flight? How quickly can I get yeah. in and out of a particular place? Um, so, so we are focusing a little bit more on some of the West coast growth markets for mm-hmm. uh, 2020 and beyond, but luckily we have our, 
uh, we have our kind of infrastructure built up in a few key places that uh, the deal flow remains. And now that we know places like Huntsville or uh, we know, although we actually don't own anything, we know the North Carolina markets very well. We've studied them extensively mm -hmm. over the last couple of years. But once, once we have an opportunity, we will be able to move on it quickly. Got it. Got it. I love to take a moment to discuss that sale leaseback strategy. It's it's and it's interesting that we're having this conversation right now. My partner and I are you know, we've spending a great deal of time over this these past couple of weeks, just really you know talking about the remainder of 2020. What are you know where we're going to be spending our energy as far as you know new offerings, new opportunities, what have you. Um, and you know one of the topics of discussion that came up, and it was based on an article I read um, a few weeks back, was you know the sale leaseback strategy. And you know we know that there's going to be lots of businesses, both small, medium, and large, that are going to be going into liquidity crunches. Right? Uh, they're going to be having a lot of challenges. They might not be going out of business, but they might be struggling uh, significantly as we roll out of this you know coronavirus and back into whatever the new state of normal is going to be. And that new state of normal could, you know, have a lot of long-term effects, right? I mean, just continually to drag down businesses and, and uh, their operations, what have you. You know, companies that were, uh, you know, very heavy on owning their real estate might have a different perspective now, you know, in, in the need of liquidity. And so, do you, do you think there could be opportunities uh, as a result of the coronavirus to where there could be, you know, quality sale leaseback opportunities with good solid companies with proven track records that just are seeking uh, additional liquidity to, to keep things rolling forward? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think so. So the sale leasebacks are generally triple net. Um, mm -hmm. So they're a subset of triple net properties. And triple net, uh, for anyone that doesn't know, just means that the tenant, the operating expenses are essentially liabilities of the tenant. They're not liabilities of the landlord. So when property taxes increase or when insurance costs increase or maintenance costs increase, the tenant absorbs those costs and the landlord doesn't. So this is triple net leases are like jack in the box, uh, you know, Panera Bread, uh, Dollar Tree or uh, Dollar General. Those kinds of properties generally are leased triple net long-term lease, maybe a 20-year lease, um, even with five or 10-year extension options after that 20-year initial term. Uh, so those are triple net leases broadly. Sale leasebacks are a subset whereby you, as the purchaser of the property, are buying the real estate from an operating business mm -hmm. who has had that property as their home and they've owned it for some period of time. And they're basically saying, we can use our cash. Uh, our cash is better used to grow our business than it is sitting in our real estate. We have a higher rate of growth or a greater opportunity with our cash to reinvest it in the business than for it to be sitting in our, in our backyard. And so the opportunity is for you as a real estate investor to come in and purchase the property, which is essentially a, you know, it's as close as you get to a coupon clipper. Yeah. Um, the, the maintenance and the management are, are minimal. And assuming the, that, that business continues to pay rent, um, then it's a very hands-off model. So in that way, it's very scalable. And so, yeah, I think typically what happens uh, in, in my experience is the sale leaseback um, from the seller's perspective becomes, it starts to become an inkling of an idea when there's a meaningful financial event that happens. So typically, for instance, there is, let's say a company is purchased by a private equity company. The private equity group will say, wait a minute, why do you own your $15 million headquarters? You guys should, you don't, you don't have a mortgage on it. You own it free and clear. Why don't we sell that? We'll sign a 20 year lease. You'll pay approximately, you know, you'll pay market rent. And we'll take that $15 million, we'll reinvest it into the business, and you've created a sale leaseback. That's, mm -hmm. the, that's the kind of general structure. And it, it happens very commonly once a private equity group takes control of a business. What was the catalyst of the sale leaseback uh, for the company that, that uh, resides in that building that you purchased? Same. It was a private equity driven, uh, a private equity driven sale leaseback. Now, this is actually a public company, but they're controlled mm -hmm. by a private equity group. Um, and, and this was also kind of one of our defensive investments. It's a, it's an infrastructure, uh, construction company. So they build solar 
solar farms and bridges and civil kind of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. And they had a couple of years of revenue pre-booked. Uh, so a couple of years of future revenue pre-booked. And one thing in a sale leaseback that is a different muscle to flex as, an, as a real estate investor is the most important thing is actually the credit worthiness of the tenant. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. It's not the, it's not necessarily the structure of the property or the bones or even the location. Uh, those things are all important, but you're buying, you're buying the likelihood of that tenant continuing to pay you throughout the term of their lease. And so you really mm -hmm. need to understand their financial, uh, you know, their financial history and their ability to pay. Yeah. And it, it makes it a very lendable property as well. Like, I, do you mind sharing some of the details and the type of debt you're able to, uh, to, to put in place on that property? Uh, that you, that you yeah. Can, so uh, on that property, we have uh, a 10 year, 10 year fixed uh, debt through a regional bank, oftentimes for commercial properties. So this is one of the drawbacks to commercial properties as a sponsor or as the, uh, yeah, as a sponsor. You typically, uh, at least under a certain dollar amount threshold, you're typically going to be taking on recourse debt. And mm -hmm. oftentimes it's going to come from a local, like a regional or a local bank. Um, now, on the flip side, they generally are very easy to work with. Uh, they're pretty easy to, to restructure deals with even if you, uh, if you need to restructure something after the closing. And they will typically offer pretty favorable terms and, uh, and very high leverage if you need it. So in this particular deal, and of course, this is also dependent on the credit worthiness of the, of the tenant. The, the bank is gonna be underwriting the tenant mm -hmm. first. So on this particular deal, I think we're at four and a quarter, um, about 70% LTV and a 10 year fixed rate, which, um, you know, it's not the absolute best terms you're ever going to hear about, but it's solid. And when you're yeah. talking about purchasing, uh, when you're talking about a 300 basis point spread between your interest rate and your going in cap rate, that works. Cash flow. Yeah, it does. It does work. <laughs> and again, the, the, the most important thing, we, didn't, we haven't talked about this yet, but the most important thing for us is risk-adjusted return. Mm -hmm. You can go after super high returns, but what's the risk? Um, and in, this, in these cases, sale leasebacks, for us, we like them as more of a defensive play, um, something that's going to maybe clip off 7 or 8% annual cash flow, uh, the upside isn't necessarily tremendous. It's very consistent. It's very stable. And so it has a, it has a place in most people's portfolios. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to look at it as, you know, versus wealth creation, it's wealth preservation, right? It's just as you had put it. I mean, it's a coupon clipper. It's a very safe bet and it's consistent cash flows, which is, you know, depending on the, uh, you, you know, the, the, population you're going after as far as your investors are concerned, either they're looking to hit home runs and grand slams, or they've already made some capital and looking to preserve that for the long term and ensure that they've got monthly income or quarterly income coming on a, on a consistent basis. So, uh, yeah, exactly. no, it's, it's, it's an absolutely beautiful thing. And so, I, I, I'd like to switch gears if we could, um, Matt, and I'd love to talk about, you know, you know, the, the, the state of the world that we're in right now with the coronavirus, with, you know, COVID-19 and, um, you know, I, I haven't been able to find one on Amazon. I think they're all sold out, the crystal balls, uh, as far as what the future holds and uh, what opportunities might present themselves. And again, it's it's all so soon. I've been I've been very reluctant to actually talk a lot about this, uh, you know, more more to the public eye as far as, you know, you know, what you need to be doing today to get prepared, what have you, because everything is still so new. I mean, we're literally only a couple months into this, right? And, and the long-term effects, uh, it, it's going to take months and years some really to see how they play out. But I love, you know, you guys have put some thought into this. Everyone has, right? If you're in real estate, you've given a great deal of thought as to not just where you're at today with your own investments, but, um, you know, how do, we, how do we prepare and how do we identify opportunities that might come out as a result of, of the pandemic? And so, what are your thoughts on that? And uh, what are you guys doing on your side to you know, prepare for any opportunities that might come your way? Yeah. So I think, so first of all, you're right. The last, I would call it month for us has been heavily focused on getting our own house in order mm -hmm. and looking at every single property we have and trying to strengthen our position in any possible way. Um, and so that, that's where the majority of my energy has been in the last several weeks. Um, I think we're still, you know, I'm personally still kind of waiting to see how things play out. I think over the next, we are, 
what are we, April 28th? We're, we are um, at a moment where several states are uh, reopening in varying capacities. And I think the month of May is going to be a very telling, uh, just kind of moment where we're going to see, we're going to know a lot more in 30 days than we do today. But what I do think, things that I'm looking at and things that I'm interested in are, I, I think people still, the, the downturn in the stock market, although now it's not as much of a downturn as it was, <laughs> uh, but the volatility at, at least yeah. is yeah. making a lot of kind of normal everyday people think about how much do I actually have exposed to the stock market and how much do I really want to be exposed or how much do I have exposed to my particular company that I work for um, and, and how much do I want to be exposed. So I think there is going to be a growing appetite for these not home run real estate deals, but more simple, steady, um, kind of consistent income producing uh, real estate opportunities. Mm -hmm. And to your point, I think sale leasebacks or triple net leases um, could be could be a part of that. So I think kind of a defense, almost a defensive um, portfolio uh, is going to be interesting for a lot of people. On uh, separately, where you where I think the big opportunity is going to come is going to be in where is the distress. Now uh, there's distress in several parts of the market: retail, obviously, hospitality, obviously, yeah. um, and so I look at. Uh, I, I don't know that we're going to be the one that goes in and, and rescues a hotel. So I don't think that's in, in the cards for us. Um, and I don't know, retail has been interesting for us for quite some time, but we have yet to pull the trigger. And, uh, and candidly, I don't know if we're going to have the uh, conviction to do that in the next year either, uh, mm -hmm. but it will be something that we look at. But I think that uh, the properties where owners have simply been on the margin with their operating capital and they maybe have some vacancy and they don't have any, any capital to put into uh, getting a unit turn ready if it's multifamily or mm -hmm. uh, rent ready if it's multifamily or getting a, a commercial unit leased up, which typically requires tenant improvement costs um, for the landlord to pay to get, to get a new tenant in. I think there's going to be opportunities that go back to banks um, and I think there's going to be opportunities where sellers are, are going to be motivated just to remove the liability from their balance sheet, not make any money, but not lose anything either. They've lost their equity. That's not coming back, but at least they don't, uh, they're not going to be, uh, they're not going to go into foreclosure. They're not going to be sued by, uh, by their lender. So I do think those will be opportunities. What mm -hmm. we're going to be looking at um, are some uh, as much distress as we can possibly get our hands on. So mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. We are currently looking at a, a vacant multifamily property um, on the California central coast. Um, now the, it may be too early for our pricing expectations and the sellers pricing expectations to become in alignment. It may be too early. But I think as we um, kind of as we progress, the seller's pricing expectations are going to continue to kind of come down. Mm -hmm. um, you know, buyers adjust their pricing expectations much quicker than sellers, right? Absolutely. <laughs> and I think so. It's going to take some time for sellers to realize, all right, I'm going to have to drop the, the price by 15% to sell this thing. Um, so we're going to be looking for as much distress as we can handle. And that is, that means, you know, vacant or semi-vacant properties. That means, um, you know, mismanaged properties. Mm -hmm. um, we're still going to look for things in, in really strong locations uh, because we want that as a competitive advantage. Um, but we are, we're going to look for where is the, you know, where's the pain? Because that's ultimately what we are, right? We're problem solvers. You got to go where the pain yep. is. Absolutely. And, and so that's what we'll be looking at. What was the pain in that apartment complex, the current owner, to, to where it's 100% vacant? Such, such a sad story. This guy kicked people out on Thanksgiving, on the day before Thanksgiving and the day before Christmas. He had a class action lawsuit um, from his tenants against him that he is uh, currently battling. 
and the city basically uh, condemned the property because of the condition. It's in a, it's in a really good location, um, right on the way into a little downtown uh, uh, kind of core area in a great little Central Coast California town. Mm-hmm. Um, but it is it just wrong ownership. Um, the they owned it for I think 15 years. I don't think they put any money into it at all over 15 years. And so uh, the, the, the benefit for this seller is it's a great location and uh, it's, it's a property in a, in a great California market. So even vacant um, with what we estimate to be about $3 million worth of capital needs, mm-hmm. um, you know, it's still, it's still probably a seven or $8 million property. But mm-hmm. that, that, was the, that was the circumstance. It was completely mismanaged. Wow. That's unbelievable. You don't see that that often, you know, completely vacant apartment complexes and, and solid markets. <laughs> no, you don't, unless there's yeah. legal action. And that's yeah, exactly that's what happened here. Very interesting. So I want to make sure that we get to this as well. You got a project and I don't know at what phase you're, you're into this project, but I'd love to discuss it because it's, it's one that uh, folks listening probably, probably haven't seen before. If they have, maybe one other time, right? A conversion from an office building to a multifamily property. Let's talk about that one. I mean, that is, um, that, that's a one-off, right? <laughs> okay. So, it's a, it's a, yes, it is. But the, the, the headline is uh, clickbait. It's a little bit misleading. So um, this is in Santa Barbara, California. Now, Dan, my partner, went to college at UC Santa Barbara. And he lived there for many years. And this is a, a place that we have tremendous uh, broker and kind of real estate relationships. So we have really, really strong deal flow there. This deal was uh, in, it, it, was, uh, held, uh, it was held by essentially or managed by the bank after uh, the passing of a, a family patriarch. And it was built in the 60s, originally as uh, apartments. Okay. And then in the 80s, it was added onto and it was converted to office space. And this is uh, downtown Santa Barbara uh, on State Street. So a great location, walkable for all the downtown amenities. Um, so it was converted to office space in the 80s. You walk in today and there's a chiropractor in like a one bedroom apartment. (laughs) So it's technically used as office and it was rezoned since, uh, but the infrastructure of multifamily is there. And so what we did was we saw, now the the seller attempted to sell the property as an office property and attempted to get uh, a price that was, would just not be justified by the cash flow that that property was Mm -hmm. producing. One of the beautiful things about real estate Uh, is you and I can stand there and look at an opportunity together and we can see completely different things, right? You might see something that I don't see uh, through experience or creativity or something else. And that's what we, that's what we saw here. We saw an opportunity to take the, uh, to scrap the office concept and to convert the project into multifamily and uh, thereby increasing rents pretty dramatically and increasing the value of the property ultimately uh, really dramatically. Um, now, the, the challenge with this property was that it's, it, this was going to require uh, going through the city of Santa Barbara's uh, rezoning and permitting process, which is arduous to say the least. Um, and so we have been uh, through that, we've been in the process for over a year. It's been about 15 months. Um, and we are probably 30 days away from receive, receiving our building permits. So one of the, so we've already kind of, the project is already entitled. Now we're waiting for the, the technicality of the building permits, which allows us to actually go start swinging hammers. How'd the phase project work with the existing tenants that were there, right? Because you probably had to deal with uh, existing leases that were in place with these different office users, correct? We did, and we still have a couple stragglers. Okay. Uh, but for the most part, the leases were uh, short-term or on month-to-month. Mm-hmm. Good. We bought out a couple of leases. Uh, we transitioned a couple to month-to-month. Uh, for us, the flexibility was more important than the cash flow. Um, of, of the leases. We knew once we have our permits, we need people to be out quickly so that we can, you know, execute the plan. Mm -hmm. Uh, So we just did what we could. Uh, We may, we may, you know, like I said, we have one or two tenants that are still uh, kind of hanging on to the, to the last moment, but 
we, uh, we don't expect there to be any, any issues there. But what we did, what I wanted to mention to you, Kevin, is mm -hmm. we used the uh, California State Density Bonus Program, which is essentially a California mandate that allows a developer to add density to a multifamily project um, and bypass the, the local municipality's zoning ordinance. Uh, if that developer includes a certain percentage of those units as affordable units. And this is meant to do two things. Number one, to create affordable housing. And number two, just to incentivize uh, development of housing in California where there's tremendous uh, scarcity and, mm -hmm. uh, in, in terms of supply. So like Santa Barbara has 2% multifamily vacancy. Wow. It's insane. It's unbelievable. And so... <laughs> It is. So the, this project has actually received uh, tremendous attention from the city and kudos. Uh, everyone loves it because we're taking this old office product, which is no longer, it's really not necessary. It's certainly underused. Uh, it's underutilizing the location and we're creating affordable housing downtown. And so um, it's, a, it's a pilot essentially that we hope to go repeat. Um, and it's gone, you know, it's gone slow. It's gone slow, but it's, it's going to be a, a great project for our investors um, and for us. It's been fun. It's been a tremendous learning opportunity. And we are turning what we, when we bought the project, we thought we were going to be converting the 17 existing apartments into, uh, sorry, 17 existing office units into 17 apartments. Through the California State Density Program, we're actually able to convert it into 23 units. So we're going to have a 23 nice. unit property. And Santa Barbara multifamily properties trade at might be the, the cap rate might start with a three. <laughs> yeah, that's so crazy. It's, it's just <laughs> incredible. What's the average price per unit that they trade at? Probably 200, 250, or maybe even higher than that? Uh, higher. Uh, yeah. It, we're, we, we think, yeah, we think um, that it's probably worth 400,000 a unit, maybe more. <laughs> Good old California. <laughs> yeah. So let's talk about uh, rent control. It's Santa Barbara is, uh, is, is there, well, I shouldn't say is there a risk associated uh, if it doesn't exist today in Santa Barbara, because I think the entirety of the state of California, right, the, you know, the municipalities that don't have any rent control ordinances in place, like there, there's a looming, you know, risk associated with it. Um, but Santa Barbara today, uh, are there rent control restrictions that are in place uh, that you have to contend with? So California, as of January 1st, does have statewide Rent control. Is it statewide? That's right. I for, I completely forgot yes. about that. But it's it, very. I it, mean, it's 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 kind of loose, like Oregon's, right? I mean, it's it gives you what CPI plus what? It's like seven percent. Okay, so, so it, call it, it nine or ten percent. It's uh yeah, it is uh from rent from a rent control perspective, it is reasonable. Um, yeah. now the most important thing is just understanding the rules of the game, mm -hmm. and then underwriting your acquisition. Um, appropriately. Yeah. So you can, there are certain uh, ways that you can still increase rents higher than 7%, but you need to go through the appropriate kind of process. So for instance, if um, I can't, I can't kick you out of your apartment because your lease is up and I want to raise rents, I need to go pull permits to make improvements to that unit in order to meet the criteria for the state level rent control. So um, the, the alternative is I can, I can pay you to leave your unit um, and there are guidelines around how much you need to be paid. So there, there's more process um, and it's more costly, but it's not impossible to execute a big turnaround. Now that's the other thing that's happening in California in particular is I think sellers and buyers are still trying to figure out they're still dancing around uh, the rent control issue and how to understand what, what it means for the value of their property. Mm -hmm. So um, as long as you can budget for the appropriately to, to increase rents, uh, if that's your business plan to increase rents dramatically, then um, you know, it's still possible, but you need to be very uh, knowledgeable about the, the rent control regulations. Yeah. Yeah, got it. We own in New York, so very familiar with it. Uh, I think New York was the second state to go statewide uh, rent control, and California obviously being the third then, or I think Oregon was the first, correct? 
Uh, you it sounds like you may know more about the season. Yeah, I believe so. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in any event, well, good deal. Well, Matt, moving on here, I'd like to enter into what I call the you know the lightning round before we uh, uh, wrap up the show here, and this is where I'm going to ask you six. Uh, yeah, not so not personal, but you know, somewhat personal questions. Just to get to know you a little bit more on an intimate level. Um, looking for this, you know, six short, concise answers. Uh, the first one being your biggest fear, man. What is it? Um, I think I have this just kind of innate fear of not uh, achieving my potential. And mm-hmm. that is a driving kind of motivating factor for me. It's not something that I consciously think about all the time, but I, if I think deep down, uh, it's something that's motivating me. Got it. How about one biggest regret? Well, I mean, I, w- I, I, do, I do wish I would have started uh, earlier down this real estate path. Um, and I, I wish I would have realized earlier on that the, probably the thing holding me back was, uh, kind of a mentality or a mindset as opposed to anything else. Hmm. Interesting. Okay. How about most influential book? Um, I'm going to, I guess I'm going to go with rich dad, poor dad. I know that's probably, uh, that's probably one that you hear a lot, but that was a, a turning point for me. Okay. How about outside the daily work, Ryan? What do you do to decompress and relax? Um, I need to sweat. I need to go exercise, okay. go move, uh, you know, get out. I, I, I need to go kind of have, have some time where there's, I can't do anything but focus on, um, on like the immediate present task uh, ahead of me. And that tends to be exercise. Is that a run? Is that a bike? Is that a, a, a CrossFit? I mean, wh- wh- what's the it, poison of choice? <laughs> yeah. as a combination of those things. I, I was doing orange yeah. theory a lot. Uh, take my dog on a run slash hike. Um, now I have young boys that keep me very active. Uh, but I had ACL surgery back in December, okay. so I'm still recovering from that. So I'm not running yet. So I'm just, I just move my body, you know, <laughs> any way I can right now. It's a break of sweat every day, man. <laughs> yeah. How about the one thing that you can't live without? Um, this is interesting. I mean, I'll tell you this. My day goes a lot smoother if I get up early and I have a couple hours of just like solitary uh, thinking and, you know, me time. Um, mm-hmm. So right now that's like I'll get up at five, um, try and knock out a couple hours of just getting a few things done before the family, you know, the house wakes up. Um, My day, I just feel so much more centered and grounded if I do that. I agree with you. Yes. Especially now with this new working arrangement. Right. And so I I find myself and I'm not, I'm, I've always been a morning and an evening person The, the two don't work together. Well, right. I like staying up late but I also don't like missing the day. And so I like, it's, it's been very forced. I force myself to go to bed and then I force myself to, you know, wake up at, you know, a, you know ungodly hour in the morning to, you know, get that workout <laughs> in to, you know, get some me time in before the family wakes up. And again, yeah. as I get older, that's starting to take the toll on me, you know, when you're right. 20 or tw- 25, you can get away with five hours of sleep or six hours yeah, right. of sleep. As I get older, I feel like those eight or like even sometimes nine hours, you know, just for whatever reason, my body needs it. And, um, so I've become challenged with that. I have to figure that one out. But <laughs> how about one day you woke up? If, if you know, if you just decided that you no longer wanted to do uh, what you're doing today, where do you think you would spend your new time and energy? Um, well, I think I don't see myself. I think real like, estate. If you got out of real estate, if you just decided yeah. you didn't want to be in that line of work, where do you think I, you would go? Sure. I think real estate is going to be something I do for a long time. Um, but it's not my only passion. I like, you know, I've built, uh, small businesses. I own a separate, you know, unrelated local services business. Okay. Um, I like, I think if I wasn't doing real estate, um, I would be doing something, uh, in a capacity where I was able to help small businesses grow um, and kind of reach their potential, implement new processes, uh, kind of take, take leaps and strides towards, you know, bigger goals. I think something like that. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Well, good deal. Well, Matt, this has been a lot of fun here. And what I'd love to ask of you before we wrap it up here for the day, if you had just you know, one last uh, you know, golden nugget of advice or wisdom that you could leave the listeners today, you've shared a lot with us already, but if there was just one last thing that you might leave them with that might just really inspire them as they progress in their real estate investing career. What would that one last golden nugget be? 
Well, you didn't prepare me for that one, Kevin. Yeah, I know. I should. I, I tried to catch you off guard, man. <laughs> um, I think so. I I think I would just encourage. Um, I would encourage you to consider uh, diversifying your portfolio a little bit more so yeah. than maybe you were over the last few years. Uh, I think I think the 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 window of opportunity on uh, some asset classes is is probably closing um, and, and the world's going to look different. And I think at, we're all going to be best served um, if we broaden our horizons just a little bit and educate ourselves on, uh, on just kind of some alternative asset classes and just consider, you know, how important is diversification for you? Uh, I, I, would, I would encourage people to do that. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. I really appreciate it, Matt. This, this has been a lot of fun, man. Lots of great information that you've shared and um, uh, really appreciate you going uh, you know, deep into your business and giving us some uh, uh, transparency to look underneath the hood of uh, some of the deals that you've done and um, you know the intricacies that exist with each one of them. And uh, you know, very much looking forward to kind of following your progress and success here over the, uh, the coming months and years. As we all know that we're, we're all in new territory now. Um, it, it's all fresh. <laughs> It's almost like we're all starting over again in, in some ways. But uh, in any event, it's been a lot of fun having you here. And folks, if you want to learn more about Matt and his group and you know the different projects they have going on, you can go visit their website. It's uh, drivencap.com. That's driven, D-R-I-V-E-N, cap, C-A-P.com. And I'll be sure to put that in the show notes as well. And so Matt... That's all we have, my friend. Really appreciate you being here. Kevin, thank you for having me. I appreciate your time. <laughs> Guys, and thank you again for tuning into this week's show. And until we meet again next week, this is your host, Kevin Bupp, wishing you huge success. You guys take care. Congratulations. Now you've got more of the best tricks of the trade in building massive amounts of passive income from real estate. For more amazing resources, visit realestateinvestingforcashflow.com. And we'll see you next Monday morning.